Hi, this is Dr. Coucher. We're going to be talking about the preschooler and family. How do you define the preschooler? The, they're the ones that are aged three to five. There's a lot of dramatic changes from toddler, especially in five areas. Uh, physical growth starts to slow down from rapid growth of infancy. Emotional and social development exhibits in uh, gender recognition and more socialized playing. Instead of that parallel side by side that our toddler did, the preschooler, they start to play together. <coughs> and then it progresses to the best friend stage. My best friend. Cognitive development or thinking and reasoning skills progress from simple to more complex in understanding of time, letters, counting, and colors. They follow more difficult commands, and play becomes more inventive and imaginative. Language develops more rapidly. Age two, they have vocabulary about 50 words. Age three, vocabulary increases to about 150 to 200 words and can follow two-part directions. Four-year-olds, though, we use longer sentences and can describe events while five-year-olds can carry on a full-on conversation with you. Sensory and motor skills become more refined from walking upstairs, kicking a ball, and drawing simple strokes to tumbling uh, skills and drawing figures of people. They also learn to dress themselves and handle a toileting needs independently. Their physical growth is slowing while their, mo their motor and social skills are multiplying by leaps and bounds. The average weight is about five pounds a year. Weight gain is about five pounds a year and about 300, 300 <laughs> three inches that they grow yearly. They become more slender with less of a sturdy pot belly look of the toddler. Uh, this increased stature results in increased agility and performance of tasks such as hopping, jumping, riding a tricycle, and even bicycles. They begin to learn to skate and swim at this time. Organ systems mature and can withstand a little stress and change. Most children are, will toilet train at this point and have finished toilet training. Gross motor ta tasks are well developed by 36 months, three years of age. They have increased eye, hand, and muscle coordination that's evident uh, in many areas. And children begin drawing, building blocks, and dressing themselves. The three-year-old should be able to walk, run, jump, and climb a wall. Falls are very, very common in this age group as they do uh, all of these wonderful gross motor skills proficiently. They don't often pay attention but they can ride a tricycle, they'll walk on their tiptoes, uh, balance on one foot for a few seconds, and they'll broad jump as well. At age four, their skips and, and hops become where they can do that on one foot. Um, they'll catch a ball. The, the four-year-old is still refining their gross motor behaviors. Uh, and they like to start practicing those a lot. And, and this is a great time for them to participate in team sports such as t-ball and soccer. At age five, the five-year-old will skip on alternate feet. They will jump rope and they begin at this point to skate and learn to swim. With fine motor behavior, uh, those skills are the small muscles of the fingers that help a child perform, perform school readiness activities such as painting with a paintbrush, uh, cutting with scissors, drawing and writing uh, using a pencil or a crayon correctly, holding and manipulating small objects, and holding and using a knife and a fork. Though I'm, I'll be honest with you, I, I probably would not give my uh, my any of my four or five year old grandchildren a knife to use. <clears throat> and they'll do craft activities. Uh, between the ages of three and five, children usually demonstrate rapid gains in their fine motor manipulation. Their finger dexterity and tool use um, also improves. The fine motor skills don't develop overnight, but they do take time, patience, and practice. So age three, they'll build tower blocks of nine to 10 blocks high. They'll draw a circle and perhaps a few sticks that can be, that they will be a person in their mind. Um, and it may even have some facial features. 
At age four, successfully use scissors uh, to cut out a picture, copies a square and can trace other shapes, draws a stick figure with about three parts. At age five, they begin to tie shoelaces. The stick figure may have seven to nine parts, beginning to print a few letters, numbers, and words. And by this point, we're hoping that we can see them They're starting to write their name. They should be at this point. Major task, going to school. The preschooler age three to five has essential achievements required before the motor task of going to school. The preschooler must be able to go to the bathroom when needed and adequately perform necessary toileting skills like wiping themselves. They must be able to function independently for brief and prolonged amounts of time. They must be able to cooperate with not only their peers but also their adult auditory, uh, auditory authority figures. They must be able to communicate their needs by means of language and social behaviors. They must have an attention span that lends itself to sitting quietly and studying or learning. And they must also have the memory adequate for learning that what is required in school. So let's talk about Erickson at this point. Um, increased muscular, mental, and language abilities set the stage for more activities and questions. There is great curiosity and openness to learning. The favorite word of preschoolers is why. Parents who take time to answer their preschoolers' questions reinforce their intellectual initiative. But parents who see their children's questions as nuisances may stifle their initiative and cause them to be too dependent on others and to be ashamed of themselves. <coughs> Imaginative play is the basic activity of this stage. The preschooler explores and reenacts the different roles and activities of people, both real, home life, and fictional, often based on television. You know, you'll see them uh, want to reenact uh, Let It Go from Frozen. In Erickson's theory, initiative versus guilt, um, it, that's a psychological conflict of early childhood. It is resolved positively, though, through play experiences that foster a healthy sense of initiative and through development of a conscience that is not overly strict. When initiative is criticized or punished, the child learns a sense of guilt which causes doubt, affects their ability to make decisions later in life. Play permits preschoolers to try new skills and cooperate with other children to achieve common goals. Pre-operational thinking at two to seven years. This phase is where the child begins to develop an increased understanding of the world. It is characterized by operations not being reversible. It's egocentric and there's magical thinking that go along with it. There's also an advance in symbolic and creative activities such as storytelling, pretend play, and drawing. The pre-operational uh, phase that Piaget gives us with a child is it, it, they're more compatible of understanding their world. Most pre-operational thinking is self-centered and it is egocentric. According to Piaget, a pre-operational child has a difficulty understanding life from any other perspective other than his own. Um, in this time, the child is very me, myself, and I oriented. The stage is divided into two sub-phases. The preconceptual phase is age two to four, so this was why it falls within our, our, our preschooler here, in which the child sees the world only in relation to themselves. <clears throat> the intuitive phase is age four to six, in which a child's intuition is used in thinking and problem solving. Continuing with Piaget's preconceptual phase, um, it, with the two to four years, a child will act to all similar objects as though they are identical. At this time, all women are mommy or all men are daddy. Or I, I'll give you an example. Um, and my, my grandchildren are really great with saying yes, ma'am. But they'll say yes, ma'am to men and women. Uh, so we've tried to point out that when it's a man, it's it's yes, sir. But they, they just at, at you know, the age four, just having really big struggle learning that. 
<coughs> this stage is marked by egocentrism, excuse me, or the child's belief that everyone sees the world the same way that they do. That's their own point of view. They fail to understand the differences in pre perception and believe that inanimate objects have the same perceptions that they do, such as seeing things, feeling, hearing, and their sense of touch. While at this level, a child's thought is trans, uh, uh, transductive. This means the, child, means the child will make inferences uh, from one specific to another. This leads to a child looking at the moon and reasoning, my ball is round, that thing there is round, therefore that thing is a ball. Now talking about Piaget with the intuitive thought phase. This is from four to seven years. From about the age of four until seven, most children go through the intuitive period. This is a period that is characterized by still egocentric thinking, perception dominated, and intuitive thought, which is prone to errors in classification. The stage is governed by perception rather than logic. The child fails to realize that when water is poured from a beaker into a taller, thinner beaker, that there is still the same amount of water. The child has not mastered uh, conservation and can only focus on one aspect of an object at a time. And they think that objects are in a permanent state. Uh, speech becomes more social and less egocentric. It's easy to believe in magical uh, increase or uh, in decrease in disappearance. Uh, reality is not firm. Perceptions dominate their judgment. Uh, it's also a moral ethical realm. The child is not able to show principles of underlying best behavior. One of the main transitions between these two phases is the shift from totally egocentric thought to social awareness and the ability to consider other viewpoints. Language mirrors the general mental activity of preschool children. A characteristic of four and five year olds is their egocentrism, their tendency to view the world from their own perspective or point of view. So for example, if asked, why does the sun shine? A typical response from a preschooler might be to keep me warm. This self-centeredness is due to a child's mental inability to see things from another point of view. Uh, causality resembles logical thought and preschoolers understanding is limited. Concept of time is not completely understood. They understand time in relation to events that they are familiar with, meal times, a favorite TV show, etc. Avoid yesterday, tomorrow, next week, or a day of a week as a preschooler does not understand. Use expected daily events. It helps them learn the, the temporal relationships. Uh, we touched on magical thinking with the toddler. It continues with the preschooler. Magical thinking, they often believe that their thoughts are powerful and may cause things to happen. Uh, in fact, you'll have a discussion board on that about a child that thinks that, a sister that thinks that she caused her, her brother to be ill. <clears throat> They believe they have those magical powers that can make something happen by thinking or wishing it. If something does happen, they may feel it is their fault because they wished it. <clears throat> this places them in a vulnerable position. Especially if a tragedy does happen in a family, they may think they caused it by thinking bad thoughts about that person. Their literal thinking also causes them to be very vulnerable. Caution parents to not say the child is bad. If they did something wrong, as this kind of labeling may affect the child's self-worth. So with that magical thinking in this stage, our preschoolers in, are in, in, they may feel that bad things that happen, such as being abused, is their fault. Moral judgment is at a basic level in the preschooler and the behavior is based on freedom or restriction. At age two to four, this is called the punishment and obedience orientation. Whether action is good or bad depends on results of reward or punishment. Four to seven year olds are in a stage of naive instrumental orientation in which actions are directed towards satisfying their needs and less than satisfying others. Levels of moral development. In level one, um, it's the pre-conventional morality. Stage one, um, it, individual obeys rules in order to avoid punishment. 
In the stage two, individual conforms to a society's rules in order to receive rewards. Moral development by Kohlberg uh, follows a pattern. In the early stages, the child simply tries to avoid punishment. An older preschooler proceeds through a very self-centered stage with decisions based on self-satisfaction and what's in it for me action. In later stages, children develop, develop a greater concern for being good. It's very important for them and doing what is socially acceptable. So you can understand when they're wanting to do things that are socially acceptable and they never pick up on those socially acceptable things. Um, you're, you're looking at children that we might fall, would fall on the spectrum at this point. So you have to know the normals and how they're developing so that you can look at and assess for the abnormals. Spiritual development, faith and religious practices are learned from parents or caregivers. Preschoolers have concrete concept of God who is often like an imaginary friend for them. Powerfully and permanently influenced by actions and stories of the visible spirituality of related adults such as their parents or grandparents. And so they will imitate these practices without completely understanding them. They'll understand simple Bible stories. They can memorize simple prayers. They can, they can start to memorize simple Bible verses. Children often interpret illness as a punishment from God. Preschoolers are noticing differences in skin color and racial identity. They are vulnerable to learning prejudices and biases. Uh, they also know the meaning of pretty and ugly and reflect the opinions of others regarding their own appearance. Because they are concrete th thinkers, they often have literal fears related to medical procedures such as drawing bloods and receiving injections. They may think that all their blood will, will leak out of a hole um, if you stick their skin. Bandages are important to keep things in for them. Uh, it makes everything feel better also. Preschoolers will also cry loudly in protest to shots and may even scream and voice their extreme displeasure. Sex typing, uh, that's the process by which an individual develops behavior, personality, attitudes, and beliefs appropriate for his or her culture, and sex occurs during this period. <clears throat> The most powerful influences in a child's life comes from childbearing uh, practices of their parents or caregivers and imitation. Uh, they may play dress up or imitate mommy and daddy. Sexual exploration may be more pronounced and often questions about sexual reproduction begin at this age. Sexual feelings are clearly present before the preschool years, but become more obvious now. Handling the genitals for pleasure, masturbation, kind of peaks at around two and a half years of age before becoming more private and exploring the genitals of others is also very common. Uh, we don't want to condone them, it, but we also don't want to condemn it. Uh, the solidification of gender identity and gender role identity occurs during the preschool period. Parents are often dismayed by their child's gender stereotyped play, even when the, play, the family has espoused less traditional roles. With social development, separation individu individuation process is, is completed and the preschoolers have overcome much of the anxiety associated with strangers and the fear of separation. They still though crave that parental security, the guidance, the reassurance, and the approval. Throughout that preschool period, <clears throat> any child from age two to five years old could regress uh, momentarily to a total infantile dependence, such as going limp and saying, I'm a baby, and then quickly show independence, declaring, I can do it myself. Even when the task is something he or she has never done before. Uh, this can be very challenging for parents also during that time. Uh, they can cope with changes in daily schedule, however, find very much comfort in familiar objects. If it's a doll, it's a blanket, it's a photo of a family, what have you. Um, they use play to work through fears, anxiety, and fantasies, especially if using the proper tools such as dolls and puppets. 
an explosion. <coughs> Excuse me, I just exploded with cough. An explosion of speech and language development takes place between ages two and five. A child's vocabulary expands from around 300 words at age two to about 2,100 words uh, at five years. Age three to four, they form sentences of about three to four words. They can name familiar objects such as animals and parts of the body. They enjoy musicals or talking toys or dolls and imitate words proficiently. They may talk nonstop whether anyone is actually listening to them or not. Uh, they enjoy reading, uh, those are in quotation, reading um, picture books with a parent. Uh, ages four to five years, they have longer sentences <clears throat> that are used and they can follow simple directional commands, put the crayons in the box, and they'll obey prepositional phrases such, uh, as, such as uh, under, on top of, beside, and back of, or in front of. By the end of five years of age, the child can use all parts of the speech correctly with verbs, nouns, prepositions, and adjectives. <coughs> In addition, preschool children learn many language concepts, such as different names for the same object or person, the concept of opposite, and they can describe an object by composition. A spoon is made of metal. That's just an example. Uh, the ritualism and negativism of toddlerhood is diminishing in the preschooler. They're able to verbalize their autonomy and request for independence. They want to do everything, everything by themselves. By four or five, they require little assistance with dressing, eating, and toileting. And goodness, if you try to help them during that time, they will tell you they can do it themselves. Um, they may put their shoes on the wrong feet, their shirt might be inside out, they might button it up wrong. Uh, they should master tying their shoes by the end of five years. They can obey warnings of danger. The preschooler is very sociable and wants to please. By the beginning of school age, they begin to challenge parental values and lean more towards opinions and fears. Play is an important one that we're going to talk about. It is through play that much of children's early learning is actually achieved. The physical, social, uh, socio emotional, and intellectual development of children is dependent upon their activity. Uh, through touching, manipulating, exploring, and testing, children find out about the world around them. Associative play occurs when children play with each other, sharing similar materials and activities in an unorganized way. <clears throat> Boys play in, a, play in a stand with heavy equipment. Um, most of, one of the most obvious tasks of developmental progress for a preschool child is learning to interact happily with peers. At the age of two years, most play is still that parallel play, playing, you know, they're, they're playing in the same area, but they're not playing together, if you'll remember that. Although children frequently look at their peers and copy some of those a their actions, um, by the age of three, children should have mastered aggression, and <laughs> I know, aggression, and should be able to initiate associative play with the peer. Children engage in different types of play depending upon circumstances and particular needs. The types of play range from an active observation to participation in a group play requiring planning and cooperation with others. Pretend friends are very common in children up to the age of four. These fantasy figures often fill the role of a scapegoat uh, for misbehavior, <clears throat> demonstrating that the child recognizes correct behavior but can't always do the right thing. They also have dramatic play. I'm the mommy, you be the baby. They'll do dress up, they'll do cops and robbers, they'll do PJ mask, um, they'll do all of those things. Fantasies are real in, their, in the minds of children. And if they're dressing up in PJ mask, they are PJ mask. If they are dressing up as Batman, they are Batman. They're, they are not Oliver, they're not Elliot. They are those characters that they're dressed up as. If it's a girl, there it's it's not Anna, um, it's not Elizabeth, it, it's Elsa, or it is Beauty from Beauty and the Beast, Belle. <coughs> 
So fantasies are real in the minds of children who are engaged in dramatic play. They can switch roles from animate to inanimate objects with the blink of an eye. They're carefree, they're creative. Uh, dramatic play promotes cognitive development and it helps children to learn how to share, communicate, and cooperate well with others. Uh, through role playing, children can also learn how to develop empathy for others. And TV can have some negative effects as well as positive, depending on what is being watched and how much. Educational media may be the most beneficial. With preschool and daycare, structured learning is not as important as social climate. The type of guidance and attitude toward children fostered by the, the teachers is really important. <coughs> and teachers should be knowledgeable about childhood growth and develop to provide uh, an, an, a growth and development to provide the proper activities. Quiet play, active outside play, group activities, creative play snacks and rest times need need are needed for appropriate learning and development a parent should also evaluate a preschool before enrolling their child what parents should look for is it licensed and, a, and a, do they have a regulated program uh, plenty of room to run and play sturdy toys teacher to child ratio outdoor areas for play teachers trained in cpr teachers trained in early childhood education Ability for a parent to drop the, into, at the school anytime. And school readiness. Is the child ready to enter a social and educationally based environment? Is the parent ready for that? That's another thing. Social maturity, uh, especially attention span, is a major indicator. The school should help the child gain more independence, adapt to social uh, world with peers, uh, teach rules and consistency, challenge a child's imagination and creativity. A developmental screening may help identify if a child is ready. Parents' attitude towards learning plays a major role in how the child transitions, though, to that school. Children in daycare, especially three years of age, have more illnesses, especially diarrhea, hepatitis A, uh, meningitis, otitis media, and respiratory tract infections. It's also important that good hygiene is encouraged after using the bathroom, when coming in from outside play, and before eating. You want to inquire about their sick child policy and the cleaning of the equipment and the toys. Also, we want to encourage parents to take the child to visit preschool and meet the teacher and some of the children before that first day. Kind of take some of that anxiety away from both of y'all. For sex education, we need to find out what children know and think. Where did I come from? It may or may not be a question about sex education. Be honest and, and give them correct information and pronunciations, although they may not comprehend and uh, only remember parts of the information. Avoid over answering the question and give them small bits of information that they are developmentally able to absorb. Sexual exploration, we've already talked about this, and sexual curiosity is very common and often involves other playmates at this age. Parents should use a positive approach and neither condemn or condone it. We don't want to punish them. Um, we might also need to have the parent or we as a nurse to investigate further. Um, why is a child obsessed with the activity and acts out sexual intercourse or mimics adult sexual behavior? Parents should not worry if the child is social and outgoing, uh, but we should be a little bit concerned about these acts being presented uh, quite often. And it is a time to then start assessing further about who is touched and if there has been anyone touching rather. <coughs> Fears. It's normal for a preschooler to be fearful. Some three and four year olds are frightened of very specific things like bugs, dogs, and the dark or clowns. Certain fears are particularly prevalent during the preschool years because a child's highly active imagination may make him worry about uh, make believe creatures. His and your health, death, disaster, and pain. Being hurt is another common fear. That's why your preschooler wants to cover up even the most minor scratch or cut. Acknowledge those fears. They may seem silly and irrational, but they're very real and serious to the child. 
reassurance and comfort to help them learn that it's okay to have fears and that it's best to deal with them. Involve the child in finding a method to deal with experience. Maybe a, a light night light to scare away the monsters, or how about a monster spray to spray a room and under a bed, uh, or investigating and, and saying you've swept all the monsters out. There's no more left. Another characteristic of the preschooler thought is animism. Animism is evident when children credit inanimate or lifeless objects with lifelike qualities, such as feelings and thoughts. Uh, to that young child, things that move are alive, like a piece of paper blown by the wind or a flowing stream. Animism has its own charm and occurs frequently in children's stories and fairy tales. A familiar example is uh, the scarecrow who comes to life in The Wizard of Oz. Sometimes, sometimes children cry if a favorite stuffed animal is kicked or callously tossed out of the way. This is a prime example of animism. Uh, the stuffed animal is hurt by such a careless, uh, carelessness and, and abuse that is uh, enacted on it. All right, so beginning of school for, for these babies can be very stressful. Um, stress is a very normal response that everybody feels from time to time. Some stress is helpful because it motivates us. Stress is bad when it interferes though with our daily activities, relationships, and our health. Even very young children can experience stress. So how do you know if your child is stressed out? Um, stressors would be a birth of a sibling, a divorce or separation, relocation, and illness. Evidence of stress in a preschooler. They have increased crying, sleep disruption, for the verbal preschooler, evidence of stress may include acting out behaviors, including defiant speech and actions, anger problems, stomach aches or headaches, decreased appetite, inability to control their emotions, nightmares, or they may just be extremely clingy and whine. Aggression, something that we all don't like to see, but it, it does happen. Uh, the behavior that attempts to hurt a person or destroy property. It is influenced by biologic, sociocultural, and familial variables. It's different from anger, but anger may be expressed through that aggression. Hyper-aggressive behavior in preschools uh, is responsible for unprovoked physical attacks on other children and adults, a destruction of others' property, frequent intense temper tantrums, extreme impulsivity, disrespect, and non-compliance. Some aggression is a normal part of a preschooler's development. Factors that increase that aggressive behavior would be gender. Males are more overtly aggressive than females. Uh, they tend to play army um, or cowboys or superheroes. Uh, frustration. Sometimes children like a grip on vac uh, vac a grip on vocabulary like me just now. Uh, pushing and hitting are the closest ways for them to express their frustrations and they demonstrate their lack of social skills through pinching, biting, or any other form of aggressive behavior. Modeling of other siblings or playmates, violence in the home or on television. There is a different correlation between media exposure and physical and relational aggression. Reinforcement. If a child feels neglected, he will try to get attention in any form. An arrival of a new sibling can make him feel resentful or neglected. He may just retaliate by pushing the child. What do you do? First of all, we have to respond quickly. Try to respond immediately if you see your preschooler getting aggressive. Remove him from the situation for a brief time out. Three or four minutes are a lot of, t a lot of time for a preschooler. The idea for a timeout is for him to connect his behavior with the consequences and figure out that he, if he misbehaves, he will be the sufferer and miss out on all the fun. React in a consistent manner. As much as possible, respond to his aggressive acts the same way every time. Eventually, it will sink in that he gets a timeout or he misses out on all the fun. Monitor the electronic, electronic viewing. You want to avoid TV programs, computer, computer games, etc. that uh, have violence with them. 
uh, reward good behavior. Rather than paying attention to your preschooler only when he misbehaves, try to catch him being good. Uh, some children have more trouble with aggression than others, and sometimes it is an undiagnosed learning or behavior disorder that's behind that frustration and that anger. So you've got to know your normals again so that you can assess the abnormals. Uh, speech problems, disfluency, uh, stuttering or stammering occurs because ideas are able to come to mind faster than the toddler's limited ability to express them. More commonly if the toddler is stressed out, excited or even tired. Uh, give the child your full prompt attention as he or she speaks and do not comment on a cri or, or criticize the stuttering. Speak slowly and relaxed. Uh, I have a grandson that when he starts to um, get real excited and he wants to tell me something and he says, and, 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 and I'll say, baby, just, it's okay. Just take your time. Mimi's not going anywhere. So he take, he'll stop and he'll take a deep breath and he'll finish what he's trying to say. Um, Dyslalia, dis, this, dyslalia is this is the articulatory disorder in which very often children do not pronounce the sounds clearly or they replace one sound for another. Uh, K may be replaced by T or G, or it, and it's G, a G could be replaced with D. Um, how about um, uh, instead of saying their L's, they'll say their W's. Uh, I ha my grandson's name is, is Oliver and uh, his brother is Elliot and he'll say Elliot and he, we've been working with him to say his L's and he really puts a strong uh, pronunciation there on those L's, Elliot, but he works on it. If the stuttering is accompanied with other signs such as tics, grimacing, extreme self-consciousness, or if the stuttering persists longer than six months, consider having the child evaluated by a speech pathologist. Um, the Denver Articulation Screening Exam is a tool that screens articulation disorders in preschool children. We also want to promote good nutrition. Healthy nutrition during childhood should include eating a variety of foods, consuming sufficient uh, energy to promote uh, growth and development while avoiding development, uh, development of obesity. Preschooler uh, calorie requirements are similar to toddlers at about 1,400 to 1,600 kcalories a day for a moderately active child. Uh, and the needs change according to activity. They can be very picky eaters. Uh, they may get on a food kick, uh, find nutritious foods they like, and this may change daily with them. Emphasize reducing sugar, sugary sweetened drinks, sodas, or fruit juice. <coughs> Increase the whole grains, vegetables, and fruits. They need about 16 ounces of milk per day, whole 2% or 1%. Protein requirements increase with age. Preschoolers, uh, 13 to 19 grams per day. <clears throat> so approximately half to three quarter of an ounce of uh, protein daily. Um, avoid obesity. They need to have three structured meals a day with a variety of foods and two to three small healthy snacks per day. Uh, you can look at that information on choosemyplate.com. That's still out there. Avoid fast foods, uh, too high in fat and calories. Uh, do not use sweets as a reward and do not require them to have a clean plate. Sleep and activity. They, preschoolers sleep about 10 to 12 hours per night, but there is no reason to be completely rigid about 10 to 12 hours. Um, if a five-year-old gets adequate rest at night, he no longer needs a daytime nap. Instead, a quiet time might be substituted. Most nursery schools and kindergartens uh, have brief quiet periods when a child lies on a mat or, or just lays there and rest. Um, importance of play in preschoolers' development can, can't be overemphasized. So we want to make sure that we provide a safe environment. Uh, that, that's very important. Uh, screen time, again, TV, computer, video games, handheld games, iPod, iP iPads. I think we really need to be limiting these.
Toddlers, I mean, preschoolers can have sleep problems. Nightmares may haunt preschoolers in particular. This is an age when those normal fears develop and imagination starts to peak. They may wake up crying and fearful, moaning about monsters and witches, and have trouble falling back to sleep. Nightmares can result from listening to a scary story, watching a frightening or exciting television program, or just from being overly tired, anxious, or stressed during the day. When a child wakes up from a nightmare, they often they can often remember their dream and talk about it. Um, and let them, because they're seeking comfort. Night terrors are sleep disturbances in which a child suddenly bolts upright in bed, cries, screams, moans, mumbles, or thrashes about with eyes wide open, but they're not awake. Um, because a child having a night terror isn't really awake, he's unaware of others' presence, and it's he's he isn't likely to respond to anything said to them. My daughter, when she was in college, I know this woman was not a preschooler, she was a woman in her mid 20s and she was or early 20s I'm sorry and um, she was my daughter's roommate and she warned her that she would have that she still had night terrors and I mean she's in her 20s and still having them Olivia said it was the scariest thing ever to have her wake up screaming like that assess the problem include uh, okay so back to that we want to assess the problem and in including uh, cultural practices before recommending solutions we, we really need to make sure that parents understand a consistent bedtime routine helps the child slow down. It reduces resistance for going to bed. We don't need to give in to attention-seeking behavior. Take the child at, into the parent's bed or allow them to stay at past their bedtime. Um, we, don't, we need parental consistency because that's very important. Uh, another thing is offer a nightlight to make sure that they have their favorite toy or a drink of water at their bedside. Deciduous teeth, also known as the baby teeth, primary or milk teeth, are the teeth that children have due to the fact that infant jaws are too small to accommodate the adult size teeth. By the time a child is three years old, he or she has a set of 20 deciduous teeth. 10 in the lower and 10 in the upper jaw. Each jaw has four incisors, two canines, and four molars. The purposes of the molars are to grind food, and the incisors and canine teeth are used to bite into and tear the food. By the time the average child is six, the jaws and jaw muscles have grown in size and strength, and this paves the way for the arrival of those permanent teeth. A child's deciduous teeth are extremely important because they serve the following critical functions. They allow your child to chew naturally nutritious foods like fruits and vegetables. They are involved in speech development and they help the permanent teeth by saving space for them. In addition, children with healthy teeth also have a better chance of general health because disease in the mouth can endanger the rest of the body. Good oral uh, health means preventing cavities. Um, it is the most common disease in children. Cavities form when the bacteria in the mouth ferment the sugars and food into acid, which eats away at the teeth and then it causes holes. Cavities can be prevented when you know the risk factors and recommend the, the proper dental care practices. Hygiene is a major contributor to healthy teeth. Parents still need to supervise and or brush their preschoolers' teeth. Kids can practice flossing at age three. But parents need to be encouraged to help floss their children's teeth either with regular floss or with the handheld disposable flossers. Baby teeth are particularly prone to decay between the teeth due to their anatomy and they have a really thin enamel, so flossing is very important. Diet is perhaps the biggest factor in the formation of cavities. Uh, we want to limit cariogenic foods, uh, foods producing or promoting the development of tooth decay, uh, sugary, starchy, or sticky foods. Trauma to the teeth are very common because what's a, a common thing with, with these, these children at this age? Falls. Uh, so we need to have it, look at it evaluated as ASAP uh, because we need to make sure that the preservation of the space for the secondary tooth or teeth remains intact. Injury prevention. 
Preschoolers have improved coordination, growth, and fine motor skills and balance, so they do have less falls. But they're also uh, they are also less reckless, listen to parental rules, and are more aware of potential dangers. They put things uh, less things in their mouths, but poisoning is still a danger. There is an increase in motor vehicle versus child accidents related to playing in a parking lot, street, driveway, riding bikes or trikes, running after balls, or forgetting safety when crossing the street. Emphasis is now on educating uh, education concerning safety and potential hazards and on appropriate protection. Parents should role model setting examples of safe behaviors. They need to wear prote protective gear, bike helmets, elbow and knee pads when they're riding a bike. Preschooler are in, preschoolers are imitators and will follow their role models. Motor vehicles, we need to make sure that parents are using federally approved car restraints. Um, the laws change quite frequently and each state has different laws. Um, I'm not even going to go into the laws because our state has a different set of laws from California who has a different set of laws from Oregon. I, I don't know that exactly if that's the, those are the states, but there are different states with different ones. Um, I think of the for the most part, a uh, car seat for children under the age of four or weigh uh, less than 40 pounds. Children under 100 pounds should still ride in the back seat. They don't need to be riding in the front. Uh, so those are some just some given ones. Swimming instruction enhances a, a child's safety. Children playing near water need constant supervision by a responsible adult who can swim. Poison. We Continue to place toxic substances out of their reach. Uh, dispose of unused medications. Guns in the home. Keep the ammunition separate from the gun. Use a trigger lock on the gun and store the gun unloaded in a locked box or cabinet. Strangers. Not all child molesters are strangers. Uh, alert children to dangers without frightening them. Make sure they know there should be no secrets between you. <clears throat> tell them to tell you if someone makes them feel uncomfortable or has asked them to do something that is wrong. Use helmets with bikes. Um, in addition, teaching the preschooler safe words in case of an emergency. Warning against stranger danger and how to call 911 are all personal safety issues that should be addressed with the family. <clears throat> Child care focus shifts from protection to education. Um, and this is just guiding them. Injury prevention shifts from protection to education. School entry is an adjustment for parents as well as children. Children begin questioning previous teachings of parents and children begin to prefer companionship of peers. During the second half of the 20th century, a new process called immunization was introduced on a wide scale. Um, we have many now that are moving away from wanting immunizations. I know this is a, it's a struggle on that one right there. This led to, immunizations led to the global eradication of smallpox, uh, the Olymp uh, elimination of polio from the U.S. and almost eliminated a tetanus, diphtheria, mumps, and congenital rubella syndrome. Serious consequences such as miscarriage, stillbirths, and a constellation of severe birth defects resulting from a rubella virus infection during pregnancy. Immunizations uh, greatly reduce the incidence of measles, pertussis, and meningitis. Millions of deaths and other tragedies have been prevented with it. Uh, with communicable diseases, uh, it is, prevent, where it is prevented due to the vast majority being immunized. Um, we call this herd community immunity. This protects those that have not yet or cannot be immunized, like newborns, those with chronic illnesses. Since the discovery of antibiotics and antitoxins, many complications secondary to the primary communicable, uh, communicable disease, such as pneumonia, uh, otitis media, staph infections, um, they have been, this has been controlled or avoided. Um, but we see, still, we're seeing a, a kind of a change and a shift, aren't we? A lot of, a lot of people are 
saying they don't want their their children immunized immunized and I, it is a struggle for nurses to deal with this type of stuff in the uh, in the healthcare setting right now uh, giardias and pinworms is caused by the protozoan giardia instantalis it's a very common intestinal parasite um, clinical it, the potential for transmission is great because it is a, a survivor uh, I, I, I typed that and when I typed that I immediately um, thought of <coughs> excuse me for that I immediately um, thought of destiny's child and started singing in my head I'm a survivor mode of transmission is person to person food and animals especially puppies it's found in contaminated water like mountain lakes and streams swimming or wading pools uh, that uh, infants are in uh, with their diapers and child care centers are a haven for this, this disease uh, the manifestations for it infants and young ch children will have diarrhea vomiting anorexia failure to thrive especially if they're chronically exposed Children older than five years of age will have abdominal cramping, intermittent loose stools, and constipation. Stools with this are malodorous, they're watery, they're pale, and they're greasy. It does have a spontaneous resolution in four to six weeks. Um, if we do see a chronic form with it, it presents with intermittent loose, foul-smelling stools, uh, abdominal bloating, flatulence, sulfur-tasting belches, epigastric pain, vomiting headache and weight loss flagell um, tenedazole and nitrozoxanide are all the drugs of choice education of the, uh, the parents is the only real way to prevent the transmission washing hands after diaper changes do not allow children who have diarrhea to swim in pools or lakes um, and must be free of infection for two weeks Pinworms is also one of the most common um, infections in the U.S. Crowded conditions such as classrooms or daycare centers are good sources for transmission. It causes uh, perianal itching and thus the children scratch. Eggs are deposited on their hands and then transferred to another host. Uh, it's usually hand-to-mouth -to transmission. What you're going to see is perianal itching, general irritability, restlessness. Uh, poor sleep, maybe even bedwetting, distractibility, short attention span. Uh, parents will note perianal dermatitis and excoriation secondary to the itching. If the worms migrate on little girls, then there could be possible uh, vulvovaginitis or urethral infection. So nursing care and management for it is important to ex assess uh, recent exposure to, to infectious agents, uh, prodromal symptoms, immunization history, history of having diseases. Uh, key factors in limiting the spread of communicable diseases are prevention and control. We have to be familiar with signs and symptoms of infectious disease and provide appropriate care and intervention. We want to identify infectious agents as, uh, so it's important to reduce and prevent exposure and per spread to susceptible ind individuals. The first signs may be a rash or sore throat or, or uh, uh, it, again, if, if we're talking about Giardis or, or uh, pinworms, then we're going to see scratching or diarrhea. Uh, when the nurse suspects that there is communicable uh, disease, assessment must include uh, any recent exposure to infectious agents, uh, prodromal symptoms, symptoms that occur between exposure and a full-on clinical manifestations. Um, was there a fever? Was there a rash? What were we seeing? Have they been fully immunized? immunized? Um, if we're talking about uh, children that have picked up any, any diseases from lack of immunization of others. A history of having the disease. Have they had it documented? Uh, do they have natural active immunity? Knowing immunization history and the history of potential exposure to infectious agents is, is pretty vital. We want to prevent the spread of, of any diseases or, or bacteria um, or, uh, or, you know, like with pinworms, we, don't, we, we want to try to prevent it. 
uh, prevention has two components prevention of the disease and control of its spread to others primary pre uh, pre prevention with these diseases is immunization controlling spread of disease includes reducing cross-contamination between infected persons and not infected persons so healthcare workers siblings and classmates if a child is in a hospital sitting, setting with undiagnosed uh, eczema, a skin eruption accompanying certain infectious diseases such as measles or scarlet fever, uh, we want to put them on strict isolation that needs to be instituted until diagnosis is definitely confirmed. Uh, childhood diseases requiring uh, uh, isolation are diphtheria, chickenpox, measles, tuberculosis, adenovirus, hemophilus uh, influenza type B, influenza, mumps, my, uh, mycoplasma, pneumonia, pertussis, plague, streptococcal pharyngitis, pneumonia, scarlet fever, and in this day and time at where, where we are when I've recorded this, um, we want to look at COVID-19. <laughs> Always include hand washing and to prevent airborne spread. Cover the face with tissue when sneezing or coughing and prompt disposal of the tissues. Most children recover from most infectious agents, diseases without complications. However, any child receiving steroid therapy, immunopressive therapies, those with malignancy such as leukemia or lymphoma, and those with immunologic disorder or healthy infants under one year of age are at risk for severe complications uh, such as viremia, the presence of a virus in the blood caused by varicella zoster virus. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, my son was on steroids for quite a number of years on and off a, a, throughout most of his years because he, it, I mean, he, was, it, he was just an out of control asthmatic. And he ended up getting chicken pox. I was completely shocked I, at that time. Um, I was like, this just can't be possible. But because of that steroid therapy, it just, it, it, his chicken pox uh, vaccination just became null and void. Um, we know that varicella uh, and herpes zoster is, they're, they're from the same one. Um, but it, it can leave the child with uh, painful herpes zoster, secondary to bacterial infection, depigmentation, and scarring. We don't want to get, and we'll, well, let me talk about chickenpox on the next page. So I don't know about any of y'all, but some of y'all might have grown up during the time that when you had knew somebody that had chickenpox, you go expose their child to chickenpox so that y'all can get it done and over with and out of the way. I don't know why that was the way of thinking. I remember that growing up. I, I think one of my cousins got uh, chickenpox and my mother was, uh, you know, we've got to go to Aunt Barbara's house so that you can play with Misty and you can get chickenpox and be done with it. <laughs> Um, you know, you get lesions in various stages with this. There's macules, papules, vesicles, pustules, and scabbed lesions. Uh, we'll see all in varying degrees at the same time. Chicken pox tends to be more severe in adolescents and adults than in young children. We don't want to give them any aspirin because of Rice syndrome. It is highly contagious. Isolation is needed should be kept at home and away from any susceptible individuals until all lesions are scabbed over. And it usually takes about eight to 10 days. Uh, both of my daughters ended up getting uh, a chicken pox twice. Um, of course, they had the vaccination. And the second time they had all of this pop up on them, I thought, well, this can't be chicken pox. So I took them in to see their pediatrician and she was like, oh no, this is chicken pox. I said, that can't be, they've already had it once. And so the only thing that we can figure out is that they, um, they just didn't have a big outbreak the first time, but they did the second time. It is very itchy, causes irritability, possibly secondary bacterial skin infections from the scratching. We want to use antihistamines for itching, keep fingernails clean and cut short, uh, put mittens or socks over the hands to prevent scratching with fingernails. Um, we'll also give an antiviral agent like acyclovir to, uh, 
to the high risk or immunocompromised children. Fifth disease um, is a mild rash illness that commonly occurs in most children. They get real black, uh, bright, not black, bright red cheeks. Um, it looks like slap cheeks. Um, it's a defining symptom of fifth disease in children, but the rash will not extend over the bridge of the nose or around the mouth. In addition to the red uh, cheeks, children often develop a red lacy rash on the rest of the body, uh, with the upper arms and legs being the most common locations. An ill child may have a low-grade fever, malaise, or a cold a few days before the rash breaks out. Child is usually not very ill and the rash resolves in seven to 10 days. It does appear in three stages, slapped face appearance for one to four days, then a maculopapular a rash on extremities that lasts seven days. The rash subsides, but may reappear is if the skin is traumatized by heat, cold, or friction. It is caused by an infection with uh, human parvovirus B19. This virus infects only humans. Pets, or, uh, such as your dogs or cats, may be immu immunized against parvovirus, but these are animal parvoviruses that do not infect humans. Makes you wonder with COVID right now. Um, the virus is probably spread um, from person to person by direct contact with those secretions, such as sharing a drinking cup or utensils. Uh, during school outbreaks, 10 to 60% of students may get fifth disease. Parvovirus B19 infection may cause a serious illness in persons with sickle cell disease or similar types of uh, chronic anemia. There is not a vaccine or medicine that prevents parvovirus B19 infection though. Excluding persons with fist disease from work, child care centers, or schools is not recommended uh, as it's not likely to prevent the spread of the virus Some, since people are contagious before they develop the rash. So they've already been exposed. Roseola is a common viral disease of small children. It is caused by the human her uh, herpes virus 6, HAV6. Uh, it's related to, but not the same as herpes, herpes simplex or chickenpox viruses. It takes about 5 to 15 days after exposure to the virus to develop roseola. Uh, it's distinguished by the way in which the symptoms appear. In the first phase the, phase, the child develops a high fever. The temperature may reach 104 to 105. Uh, febrile seizures are relatively common, about 1, to 10, uh, one in 10 patients. With roseola because of the high temperature, but the virus does not directly cause the seizures. Just remember that. In the second phase, they'll get a red rash with bumps that appear. The hallmark of roseola is the rash appears after the fever goes away. Although occasionally the rash may start while the child is still febrile or may not appear until a little while after the fever breaks. Once the fever breaks, the child is usually not contagious despite the rash. There is no vaccine available for roseola, and since it is a virus, antibacterial antibiotics uh, will not help. So measles, mumps, uh, rubella, uh, and this is a prevention of the, with the MMRs. Um, are there are, the measles are a bad cough, runny nose, fever, red, watery eyes. That's the first sign. Sometimes at this stage, approximately two days before the rash, small red spots with blue-white centers appear inside the mouth. Uh, those are complex spots. After three to four days, a rash begins with red spots, first appearing behind the ears and at the forehead, spreading down the neck and arms, trunk, and finally the legs. The red spots can merge together on the face. Measles do not usually itch, though. They're highly contagious. Secondary infections, uh, including an upper respiratory infection, otitis media, conjunctivitis, uh, pink eye, treat symptoms and prevent secondary infections is what we can do. Supplement with vitamin A for severe cases. Repeat dose in 24 hours and four weeks uh, later. May return to school approximately four days after the rash appears. Mumps is a viral infection of the parotid uh, salivary glands, salivary glands, and it's spread by droplet. These glands typically swell and become very painful. Mumps infections are uncommon in children younger than one years old. Mumps may start with a fever up to 103, a headache, and a loss of appetite. 
but the well-known hallmark of mumps is swelling and pain in the parotid glands. The glands usually become increasingly swollen and painful over a period of one to three days. The pain gets worse when the child swallows, talks, chews, or drinks uh, acid juice, acidic juices. Mumps in an adolescent and adult male may also result in the development of inflammation and pain of the testicles about 7 to 10 days after the parotid swells that can happen. This is accompanied by a high fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And has, has, does anybody ever, did anybody ever grow up during a time when uh, it was suspected that if someone had mumps, that if it wasn't taken care of, it was going to drop to the testicles? I remember hearing that and didn't know until I became a nurse that <laughs> dropping to the testicles is not what it did. The mumps didn't leave there. And I, was, I remember being, you know, when I had my son being scared that that would happen to him someday. I don't know why. Rubella is a viral infection characterized by mild respiratory symptoms and a low-grade fever, followed by a rash lasting about three days. Uh, it may not be diagnosed due to mimicking other mild illnesses. Rubella, though, can cause birth defects if acquired during pregnancy, uh, such as deafness, heart defects, and mental retardation. Diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Uh, diphtheria is an acute infectious disease affecting the upper respiratory tract and occasionally the skin. The most common characteristic feature of diphtheria affecting uh, the upper respiratory tract is a membranous pharyngitis with uh, fever, enlarged uh, anterior cervical lymph nodes, and edema of the soft tissues, and it gives the, the person the appearance of having a bull neck appearance. It may cause respiratory instruction. The toxin may also affect other parts of the body, including the heart and nervous systems, causing paralysis and cardiac failure. Treatment's going to be antibiotics such as penicillin um, and an equine uh, antitoxin. You want to encourage the patient to take all their meds. Tetanus is a disease caused by bacteria and dirt contaminated wound. It can cause severe muscle contractions. Deep puncture wounds pose the biggest risk of the person developing a locked jaw. Pertussis, this is the one that's gotten really big again over the years. It's characterized by severe coughing spells that end in a whooping sound when the person breathes in. Pertussis is a bacterial infection. Antibiotics may shorten the length of the illness uh, if they were started early enough. It should take a full course of antibiotics, even if symptoms are gone or the antibiotic doesn't seem to be helping. <clears throat> the first symptoms of whooping cough are similar to those of a common cold, running nose, uh, sleep, sneezing, mild cough, low-grade fever. After about one to two weeks, the dry, irritating cough evolves into coughing spells. During the coughing spell, which can last for more than a minute, the child may turn red or purple. Infection will last about six weeks. Um, uh, it can cause uh, a, a respiratory distress and or vomiting during a coughing spell. At the end of a spell, the child may make that characteristic whooping sound when breathing in. Between spells, the child usually feels well. Uh, the, the very young child and the elder, elderly are more severe symptoms likely with them and possibly should be hospitalized uh, if not put into isolation. Um, oh, and the older children's symptoms just seem to be milder. You really also need to look at um, immunization schedules. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, infants, we give the DTP, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, and the booster, the Tdap, DTAP, uh, with the diphtheria, tetanus, and a cell cellular uh, pertussis. So, um, look at the immunization schedules uh, sometime before the exam. With uh, scarlet fever, is a disease caused by infection of the throat with a uh, group. A uh, beta hemolytic. Transmission is going to be droplet or direct contact. The incubation period is going to be one to seven days. Uh, they're going to have sore throat, fever, vomiting, rash, a strawberry tongue, uh, complications, rheumatic fever, 
uh, peritonsillar abscess, uh, glomerulonephritis. Um, complications are rare with proper treatment, though. Uh, nursing management treats symptoms, fever, sore throat, lozenges, gargle, soft cool foods, and fluids. We want to prevent spread or reinfection. Uh, discard toothbrush after about three days into the antibiotic treatment. Uh, do not share drinks or foods. All right, now we're moving into probably a really hard part to talk about, and that's child mal mal maltreatment. An estimated 794,000 children were determined to be victims of child uh, maltreatment, and that was from a 2010 study. Uh, I can tell you now that that's, that's it's probably gone up exponentially. More than 60% of child victims experienced neglect. Almost 19% were physically abused, 10% were sexually abused, and 5% were emotionally maltreated. <coughs> Children ages birth to three years had the highest rates of victimization at 16.4 per 1,000 children of the same age group. Girls were slightly more likely to be victims than boys. More than one half 50% of all reports that alleged child abuse or neglect were made by such professionals as educators, law enforcement and legal personnel, social services personnel, medical personnel, mental health personnel, child care providers, and foster care providers. Such non-professionals as friends, neighbors, and relatives submitted approximately 43% of, report, of reports. And child fatalities are the most tragic, really most tragic consequence of maltreatment. Most perpetrators, sadly, were parents. Other relatives and unmarried partners of parents accounted for a smaller percent of perpetrators. The remaining perpetrators including, uh, included persons with other, such as uh, camp counselors, school employees, etc., or, or unknown relationships to the child victims. Female perpetrators who were mostly mothers were typically younger than male perpetrators who were mostly fathers. Women also comprised a larger percentage of all the perpetrators than men. Of all the parents who were perpetrators, fewer than 3% were associated with sexual abuse. More than three quarters of the perpetrators who were friends or neighbors committed sexual abuse. It's just, ugh. Neglect is the most common failure of caretakers to provide for children's fundamental needs and, and an adequate care, level of care. Although neglect can include children's emotional needs, such as lack of affection, attention, and emotional uh, nurturance, neglect typically concerns adequate food, housing, clothing, medical care, and education. It can also include lack of intervention or fostering of other maladaptive behavior. Um, an important factor in neglect may be lack of knowledge of the child's needs, needs, lack of resources, and caregiver substance abuse. Lack of knowledge to recognize emotional nurturing is vital for children is a serious issue. Emotional and uh, psychological abuse is deliberate attempt to destroy or significantly, uh, is significantly impair a child's self-esteem or competence. It's habitual verbal harassment of a child uh, by disparagement, criticism, threat, ridicule. Uh, emotional or psychological abuse includes behaviors that threaten or intimidates a child. Uh, it does include threats, name calling, belittling, shaming, rejecting, isolating, terrorizing, ignoring, corrupting, verbally assaulting, or overpressuring the child. Uh, physical abuse is a deliberate infliction of physical injury on a child. There is non-accidental, it's non-accidental tra uh, trauma, so it's injury from abuse. The Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act of 1996 defines abuse as any recent act or failure to, to act that results in imminent risk of serious harm, death, serious physical or emotional harm of a child less than 18 years by a parent or caregiver who is responsible for the child's welfare. <coughs> Shaken baby syndrome is a serious form of child abuse caused by violent shaking of the infant. Every year in the United States, it's estimated 12 to 1400 children are shaken and 25 to 30% uh, of these victims die as a result of their injuries. 
The rest have lifelong complications, uh, seizure disorders, visual impairments, including blind, blindness, uh, developmental delays, uh, hearing loss and cerebral palsy, and mild to profound mental, cognitive, or motor impairments. And that's due to tr the traumatic brain injury that they that is incurred. Um, education may be the key to prevention. Programs that teach parents about their baby's crying and crying and ways to cope, as well as education as to the damage shaking an infant can do, uh, are available. Well, why don't we talk about Munchausen by proxy? Because we just had something in the the news with this not long ago. Uh, what Dixie Rose or something like that? I can't remember her name. Uh, but this is a this is a, a serious thing. Um, an individual is usually a mother deliberately makes her child sick or convinces others the child is sick. The parent or caregiver may exaggerate, fabricate, or induce symptoms. Common symptoms presented are seizures, nausea, and vomiting, diarrhea, and altered mental status, and are usually witnessed only by the perpetrator. As a, result, as a result, doctors order tests, try different medications. They may even hospitalize the child or perform surgery to determine the cause. Um, typically, the perpetrator feels satisfied when he or she has the attention and sympathy of the doctors or nurses and others who come in contact with him or her and the child. Um, and, you know, too often they die from the illnesses induced uh, by the perpetrator. Um, the child, we, we might be concerned about it if the child is, has multiple medical problems that don't respond to treatment or that follow a persistent and puzzling course. Physical or laboratory findings that are highly unusual uh, don't correspond with the child's medical history or are physically or clinically impossible. Short-term symptoms that tend to stop when the perpetrator isn't around. A parent or caregiver who isn't reassured by good news when test results find no medical problems, but continues to believe the child is ill. A parent or caregiver who appears to be uh, medically knowledgeable or fascinated with medical details, or appears to enjoy the hospital environment. A parent or caregiver who's usually unusually calm in the face of serious difficulties with their child's health. A parent or caregiver who's highly supportive and encouraging of the doctor, or one who is angry and demands further intervention, more procedures, second opinions, or transfers to more uh, sophisticated facilities. So factors that predispose to physical abuse, parental characteristics such as socially isolated parents, young parents, single parents, characteristics of the child younger than one year, disabled uh, preterm, um, environmental characteristics, divorce, poverty, unemployment, poor housing, uh, frequent relocation, alcoholism, and drug addiction. Those are all of the factors that can predispose to physical abuse. Sexual abuse, is the definition is the use of per, uh, persuasion or coercion of any child to engage in sexually explicit conduct. The stimulation of such conduct for producing visual de depiction of such conduct. The rape, molestation, prostitution, or incest with children. Um, Depiction can be child pornography, uh, molestation, indecent liberties such as touching, fondling, kissing, single or mutual masturbation, or oral genital conduct, prostitution involving the children in sex acts for profit, incest, any physical sexual activity between family members. Um, Exhibitionism, indecent exposure, usually exposure of the genitalia by an adult man to children or women. Uh, let's see, pedophilia literally means love of a child and does not denote a type of sexual activity, but rather the preference of an adult for prepubertal children as a means of achieving sexual excitement. Nurses, we're going to see a plethora of health problems. Uh, STIs, bruises, wound infections, PTSDs, suicidal ideation, and addiction in a sexually abused child. And I'll tell you a real story. I, I've kind of tried to keep those to a minimum, but um, I had, uh, he's actually the supervisor of psych now, but 
there he used to be a nurse on site, but you know, many, many, many years ago. So, and then he came and was a shift supervisor for a lo little while. He'd come around at night and sit down and chat with us. And he said one night uh, was telling us the the story of having a patient come in um, who was uh, I want to say she was 18 to 20 years old, and she had been used in. Um, a satanic cult for ritualistic sexual uh, um, abuse and she this was this was done to this poor thing from the time that she was a, an infant until somehow she got out of it but it did not leave her um, without wounds uh, and extreme problems and so um, they saw uh, quite a bit of, of of things up there on psych and this one just really stood out to him uh, she he was going down the hall and doing his his checks and this was during a time when um, you know they could still go out to smoke at the hospital and he said he was by himself everybody going out to smoke their cigarettes and he stopped at her room and again lots of problems um, and she seductively uh, pulled up herself up to the door and told him she would like her meds and he said okay well let me go see if it's time and so he started walking down the hall to to get to check and see if it was time on the mar to give her her meds and he heard a noise behind him and this is a he's also a minister <laughs> so he said he turned around and she was slithering on the floor like a snake coming down the hallway uh, and he made it to the nurse's station and she slithered up the, the side of the nurse's station and in another world voice told him that she wanted her meds now. <laughs> he said he didn't care if it was time for them or not. He just said, oh, okay, <laughs> gave her her meds. So, I mean, you see, can see things like this in, in healthcare and uh, that was an outstanding case, but that was a case to, of, of something that happened that uh, a child endured such physical, emotional, mental, and sexual and spiritual abuse at that. Characteristics of abusers and victims, anyone including siblings or mothers can be sexual abusers, but typically an abuser is a male the victim knows. Offenders come from all levels of society and may even be prominent members in the community. Many hold jobs where contact of children is available, coaches, teachers, daycare workers. Offender may assault children, uh, many children and many times before they're caught. Incest, you may see that done by the father, the stepfather, the uncle, etc. Usually it's prolonged over many years related to the girl's reluctance of retaliation and disbelief uh, by authority. You know, she's afraid that mom's not going to believe her. Many start uh, with older child and move to younger child as the older child matures or is unavailable. Boys are victims also, quite often, less likely to re report the abuse, abuse as well and suffer great emotional harm. There may be uh, what they're going to suffer is anal penetration or oral genital contact. Often offenders spend time with the victims to gain their trust before initiating any sexual contact. Most victims are then pressured into being an accessory to the sexual activity through various means and may be unaware that sexual activity is part of the offer. Children do not tell out of fear or not being believed. The perpetrator is a trusted member or friend of the family. Uh, uh, they will be blamed and an ability to verbalize what happened if they're extremely young. So how are we going to take care of this child? Uh, we want to identify abusive situations as early as possible. Nurses have a special role in protecting and identifying children that may be in an abusive situation. Uh, we want to get history pertaining to the incident. Clinical manifestations of, of, of potential child maltreatment. Uh, there's a box on that in your text. Uh, I, I want you to look at that. Um, there's incompatibility between the history and the injury. Uh, that's probably the most important criterion on which to base the decision to report suspect, suspect, suspected abuse. There's a pattern or combination of indicators that arouse suspicion and further investigation. 
Uh, abusive parents often have trouble interacting or comforting their sick or injured child. They may be critical or angry of the child and maintain the child is responsible for their injury. Protecting the child from further abuse can be extremely difficult. Education to protect themselves from abuse and potential abusive situations, though, can prove to be invaluable. That was the end of our lecture. Um, please make sure that you are listening to these lectures and taking notes as if we were in the classroom.